Hello everyone and welcome to this week's OpenGL animation tutorial and this week we're going to be having a look at the maths and the codes behind the animation data structure and the animator. So hopefully you remember from the first episode that an animation is just a series of keyframes and a keyframe is a certain pose at a certain time of the animation. The animator's job is to keep track of the current animation time which it increases every frame so that the animation keeps progressing and each frame it also has to calculate the current pose of the model by interpolating between the poses at the previous and next keyframe. So let's jump straight into the code and we'll start off by having a quick look at the animation data structure which is definitely the simplest part of the entire system. So an animation as I've already said is just a series of keyframes and the keyframes are stored in order in this array here so the first keyframe of the animation would be stored as the first element in this array. There's also a float variable here which holds the length of the entire animation in seconds and then there's just a simple constructor and a couple of getters. If we now move on to the keyframe class you can see that the keyframe has a pose and a timestamp and the timestamp is the time in seconds from the start of the animation when this keyframe occurs. The pose is a map of the transforms for all the joints in the model at this time of the animation and each entry of this map has the name of the joint because if you remember from last week each joint has a name and the bone space transform of that joint at this time in the animation. And again we've also just got a simple constructor and a couple of getter methods. One thing that I just need to point out is that for simplicity's sake in this tutorial all of the joints have keyframes at the same time so each keyframe has the joint transform for every joint in the model. In more complex systems you might need individual joints to have keyframes at different times to other joints and so in that situation your animation data structure would have to look slightly different with an animation having an array of joint animations, one for each joint in the model and each joint animation would have a series of keyframes for that particular joint only which of course would allow different joints to have keyframes at different times during the animation. But getting back to our example code let's now have a look in the joint transform class which represents the position and rotation of a joint in relation to its parent joint. So just to remind you what that means if we were looking at the bone space transform for this joint here it would be something like this rather than being in relation to the model's origin. So a joint transform obviously stores the position and rotation of the joint in relation to the parent joint and the position is just a vector and the rotation is represented as a quaternion. Quaternions are simply another way of representing a rotation so just like how we've represented rotations as Euler rotations in all my other tutorials we can represent the same three dimensional rotations in quaternion format instead. The reason why we use quaternions here instead of Euler rotations is because it's much easier to interpolate between rotations when they're represented as quaternions. Interpolating between two Euler rotations doesn't really work and if you try to linearly interpolate for each of the three rotation values you often won't end up with the expected results. Interpolating between two quaternion rotations however is pretty simple and it gives correct looking results. Quaternions can also be fairly easily converted to other rotation representations so for example we can convert a quaternion rotation to a rotation matrix if we want to apply it as a transform and it's also possible to extract the rotation part from a transformation matrix and convert it into a quaternion if we need to. I'm not actually going to go too much into the maths behind quaternions because it's pretty complex, literally it involves complex numbers so it's a bit outside the scope of this tutorial and to be honest I'm not overly confident with quaternion maths myself but if you are interested in the maths behind these methods then you can have a look through my quaternion class and in the comments I've put links to a few other sites that explain the maths in a lot more detail than I could. So back to the joint transform class we've got a simple constructor here and next we've got a method which returns the transform as a transformation matrix and it creates the matrix in the usual way that we create a transformation matrix by first translating it using the position and then rotating it using the rotation which is done by first converting the quaternion to a matrix format so that it can be applied to the matrix. Finally we have a static method here which can interpolate between two joint transforms and this takes in the progression which is a number between 0 and 1 which indicates how far between these two transforms it should interpolate. Obviously this has to interpolate between both the position and rotation for the two transforms so to do this for the position it simply linearly interpolates for each of the x, y and z values and for the rotation it interpolates between the two quaternions by using the method provided in the quaternion class and it then just returns the resulting interpolated transform.
So that is everything in the animation data structure. So next we're going to move on to the animator class, which has the task of applying an animation to an animated model by going through the animation, calculating the current pose of the model and setting the model's pose by setting those joint transforms that we've talked so much about in the previous episodes. The first part of this class is all very simple and you can see that the animator references the animated model that it's animating. It also has the current animation that it's applying to the model and the current animation time so that's how far through playing the animation it currently is. We've then just got a simple constructor and a method that can be used to set the current animation, which also resets the timer so that the animation starts playing from the start. But all of the real action happens in this method here, the update method, which is the method that actually animates the model. This method needs to be called every frame, and as you can see, it does three things. First, it increases the animation time so that the animation progresses every frame, then, based on the animation time and the keyframe information, it calculates the current pose for the model, so that's the position that every joint in the model should currently be in. Finally, it applies this pose to the animated model by calculating and setting those all-important joint transforms in the joint class. So let's now have a look through each of these steps one by one. Firstly, the most simple part of this is increasing the animation time, which does exactly that, and then it loops the animation time back to zero when it reaches the end of the animation, which is what causes the animation to keep looping. Next up, it calculates the current pose that the model should be in, and as you can see, the pose is represented as a map, where there's one entry for each joint in the model, and each entry has the name of that joint, and the joint's bone space transform, so that's the desired current transform in relation to its parent bone. So to calculate this pose, it first finds the previous keyframe and the next keyframe in the animation based on the current animation time. It then calculates the progression value, which is a number between 0 and 1, indicating how far between these two keyframes the animation time currently is, and finally it interpolates between the poses at those two keyframes by using that progression value. Let's quickly have a closer look at how it finds the previous and next keyframes, and I did this in a very simple way here. It simply iterates through the frames until it finds one with a time that is greater than the current animation time, so that must therefore be the next frame, and so the previous frame is the keyframe from the previous iteration. Depending on what you need your animation system to do though, you could certainly do this in more optimised ways. So for example, you could keep track of the current keyframe so that you don't have to search through all of the keyframes every frame. So next we need to calculate that progression value, the number between 0 and 1, which indicates how far between the previous and next keyframes the current animation time is. This is done with a pretty simple calculation, so I just calculate the total time in seconds between the previous and next keyframes. I also calculate how many seconds after the previous keyframe the animation time currently is, and then I simply divide one by the other to give that progression value between 0 and 1. So the final job of this calculate current animation pose method is to interpolate between the poses at those previous and next keyframes using that progression value that was just calculated. To interpolate between the poses, the transforms for each joint need to be interpolated. So this method loops through all of the joints, and for each joint it gets the previous and next transform from the previous and next keyframes, and it simply interpolates between them using the method in the joint transform class that we saw earlier. It then stores the interpolated transform in this current pose hash map, along with the name of that joint, and this is done for every joint until the hash map is full of all the transforms for every joint for the current pose. And remember, these transforms are of course still in bone space. So we have now increased the animation time, we've calculated what the current pose of the model should be, and we have that pose here as the bone space transform for every joint in the model. All that's left to do now is to put the animated model in that pose, by setting those joint transforms in the joint class. However, as you hopefully remember from last time, those joint transforms in the joint class represent the model space transform needed to transform a joint from its original model space position when no animation is applied, to its model space position in the desired pose. So for this joint, that would be this transform here. The pose that we've just calculated in the animator simply has the bone space transform for each joint, so obviously we need to do some calculations first to calculate these final joint transforms. These calculations all take place in the apply pose to joints method, and this method actually gets called recursively for every joint in the model. So you can see that for each joint, firstly we just get its current pose bone space transform by getting it from the hash map using the joint's name. Next, this pose transform is converted from bone space into model space 
and we actually covered this last week so hopefully you remember that to convert from bone space to model space you have to multiply the joints bone space transform with the parent joints model space transform which you can see happening here and we have access to the parents model space transform because it's taken in as an argument for this method. This method then gets called recursively for all the children joints and you can see that the parent matrix is now the model space transform that we just calculated and then comes the final calculation to calculate the joint transform. This calculation was actually something that took me quite a while to get my head around so I'll try to explain it as best as I can. So let's say that this is the joint's original position in the model when no animation is applied and this here is the position of the joint in the current pose. So the transform that we're trying to calculate is this one here. We of course already have the model space transform of the joint in the pose position because we just calculated it here. And for now, let's just say that we also have the model space transform of the joint in its original bind position. So we have the transform of the original position, we have the transform for the target position, and we need to calculate the transform needed to go from the start position to the target position. Before we try and do that, let's have a look at a much simplified but similar kind of situation in one dimension. Let's say that we have a start position here, a target position here, and we need to calculate the transform from the start to the target position. Hopefully you can all see that that transform would be plus 3, and that we can calculate that by doing t minus s. So we could apply a similar logic to our original problem and say that this transform is t minus s, but matrix transformations don't quite work like that, and the equivalent of subtraction here is multiplying by the inverse of s, which means that this transform here can be calculated by multiplying the model space transform of the joint in the pose, which we have here, with the original model space transform of the joint, but inverted, so the inverse bind transform of the joint, which we of course calculated last episode and can easily access from the joint. So multiplying them together gives us that final transform, which we can then set as the joint transform for that joint. And just in case you're not convinced yet, I'll just quickly show you another way of looking at it. So imagine that there's a vertex at the joint's original position, and we want to transform it to the pose position here, which is of course the transform that we're trying to calculate. To transform that vertex from the original position to the target position, we can first transform it using the inverse of S, which will take it to here, and we can then transform it with transform T, which will of course take it to that target position. And so hopefully it should be obvious from this that in total we transform the vertex using T multiplied by the inverse of S. After calculating that transform, we can finally set it as the joint's transform. And after this method has been called for all the joints, the model will finally be able to be rendered in the current pose. And that is the animator's job done. So, just to recap, every frame the animator increases the animation time so that the animation keeps progressing. It then calculates the current pose in bone space by interpolating between poses at the previous and next keyframe. And finally, it calculates and sets the joint transforms for all the joints to apply the pose to the model. So that is it for this week. Next week we're going to be having a look at how we can load animations and animated models from files, and we'll be specifically looking at the Collada file format. But yeah, thank you guys very much for watching this video, do subscribe if you haven't already, have a wonderful week, and I will see you all next time.